Yuri Gagarin, born on the 9th of March, 1934, in an agrarian village on the far west of Russia, then the Soviet Union, started life at an inauspicious time. His village came under Nazi occupation during World War II. His two older siblings were sent away for slave labor, and the rest of the family was forced to live in a mud hut. After the war, he started to receive vocational training, and eventually, he found his way to being a pilot. This started a trajectory that would prove to be historic, one that would take him where no man had gone before. Today, we celebrate a seminal achievement of humankind, for on April 12th, 1961, Yuri Gagarin became the first human to orbit our planet, Earth. Welcome everyone. I'm going to announce the next group to come up is the Two You Pony Ensemble, and I am so pleased to have with us our guest speaker, special guest speaker from NASA, Dr. Michelle Thaller. Please welcome them. Good evening, everybody. We're, we're here for a really wonderful event, and one that I'm really happy has actually started to take hold all around the world. And that's to celebrate the night that the first human went into space. And this is something that actually goes beyond things like propaganda, you know, goes beyond nationality, or even that time in history. There's a moment when we first actually stepped off the planet. And so there really isn't any reason that Yuri Gagarin should have been an astronaut. He actually just showed promise as a young apprentice foundryman. And he was singled out to allow him to go on to technical college. And that it was there, actually, that he met his wife, Valentina, and they had two daughters. And on the weekends, he actually enjoyed being a trainee cadet in the local uh, flight club. So he was drafted into the Air Force. It wasn't even his choice to become a pilot, where he was soon flying MiG-15s. So on April 12, 1961, Yuri Gagarin was launched into space from the Baikonur Cosmodrome. And he orbited only once. It was 108 minutes long. And as he fell back to the Earth, this was all planned, by the way, uh, the uh, Vostok 1 didn't have any landing gear. So he parachuted out of the capsule and landed 150 miles west of where he was supposed to. And a relatively shocked farmer and his daughter walked out to find Yuri Gagarin in their field, who asked if he could use their telephone to phone Moscow. Yuri was immediately an international star. And of course, used for the propaganda of the Soviet Union, he met people like movie stars, the Queen of England, even Fidel Castro. In 1969, at the age of 34, he and another flight instructor died during a routine training flight of the MiG. And he was actually cremated, and his ashes were put inside the Kremlin Wall, which I've made a point to visit myself. So tonight, come along with us. Our first piece is called Cosmic Voyage, as we celebrate the life and the flight of Yuri Gagarin. <laughs>
So while we are celebrating Yuri's night, it's not just a celebration about Yuri Gagarin. It's about celebrating humanity and our journey into space. That being said, we do want to honor um, Yuri Gagarin's heritage at this point and play a piece by uh, one of Russia's most famous composers, Sergei Prokofiev. This is the Sonata in D major, opus 94 for flute and piano, the fourth movement.
gaze now out into the outer solar system, uh, the Voyager spacecrafts. In 1977, Voyager 1 and Voyager 2 were launched because there was actually a very convenient conjunction where all the planets were going to line up for the first time in many centuries, and you could skip from one to the other. And we decided that we, because this probe would not be coming back, it was going into interstellar space, we would put messages on it from Earth. And in fact, Carl Sagan chaired a committee to actually decide what was going to go on this golden record. Gold doesn't corrode in the vacuum of space. So we actually designed a record player. There's a little stylus on the Voyager spacecraft that you break off and actually play the record. So the very height of 1970s technology, we actually sent an LP out into space. And on that are 116 images of people and places all over Earth. There are recordings of many, many languages, of bird song, of the sound of wind and rain and waves crashing and whales, all of that. There's a greeting from President Jimmy Carter. And the Voyager spacecraft was sent out to encounter the giant planets Jupiter, Saturn, and then Voyager 2 went on to Uranus and Neptune. Now, the Voyager spacecraft, it, we are actually still receiving signals from both Voyager 1 and Voyager 2. And right now, Voyager 1 is over 10 billion miles away from Earth. That's twice as far as the distance of the orbit of Pluto around the sun. Its next encounter with a star is in 44,000 years, which isn't too shabby when you consider it's going at nearly 40,000 miles an hour right now. 
So the first place we're going to look at in this segment is Jupiter. Jupiter, of course, the king of the planets, is so large you could fit a thousand Earths inside this one planet. You'll see pictures of the giant red spot, which is a hurricane, that you could fit three Earths across and has been going on for as long as we've had telescopes to see it. We don't know how old it is. Even more fascinating, perhaps, than this giant planet, which, by the way, is mostly liquid hydrogen inside. They're called the gas giants, but by volume, they're mostly liquid hydrogen. The system of moons around Jupiter was a huge surprise to us. Jupiter has over 60 moons, but the largest four are so big that Galileo saw them over 400 years ago with a really, really bad telescope, so they're very large. Uh, the first one you'll see, Io, uh, is yellow because of sulfur being blasted out of 200 active volcanoes. It's the most volcanically active body in the solar system and was the first place that Voyager discovered that there were actually volcanoes beyond the Earth. Uh, Voyager also discovered a very, very thin ring around Jupiter itself, so even the planet Jupiter had things that we didn't know were there until Voyager got there. The next moon out is Europa, and Europa has a shell of ice, and underneath the ice is a warm liquid water ocean that in fact is rich in organic material. And you can see the sort of reddish color of the cracks in the ice of Europa. It's from the organics and the salt leaching up through the ice. And of course, NASA hopes to actually go to Europa, and, and, and we're actually going to be designing a mission soon. Farther out then, we have Ganymede. Ganymede is a moon of Jupiter, which is about the size of Mars. It would be a planet all by itself if it wasn't going around a bigger one. And Ganymede has the record right now for the most amount of liquid water in the solar system. Underneath a shell of rocky ice, we believe there are 100 mile deep oceans that we've discovered by, by studying the magnetic field of this planet. And then farthest out is Callisto, a very quiet world of craters. the atmosphere. In the case of Uranus, there's not much uh, features on it. Of course, it's famous because it's actually tilted on its side, and the rings actually orbit around kind of the wrong way that the rest of the solar system orbits. And you're going to see the moon Miranda. Uh, Miranda looks like it was cracked apart in a giant collision and then reassembled kind of haphazardly. It has cliffs that are over five miles high. Moving on to Neptune, Neptune is a blue planet where the winds blow continuously at over 1,400 miles an hour. And there is a dramatic moon called Triton. And you'll see smudges, black smudges, on the surface of Triton, which are actually geysers that are active right now. But geysers not of water, but actually of liquid nitrogen. So it's been a while since we've been to the outer solar system. And I'll let you know that we're arriving next. On July 4th of this year, the Juno spacecraft will go into orbit around Jupiter again. So we will be returning to the King of Planets once again this summer. Thank you.
All right, everyone. I'm uh, Sergeant First Class Kirsten Lee Warfield. Nice to meet all of you. Um, thanks for coming out. I hope you're enjoying Yuri's night so far. You having a good time? Uh, I want to let you know that we are going to have an informal meet and greet with Dr. Thaler in uh, the day room afterwards. Uh, so I hope you can join us. I've got some moon pies and tang. Uh, and there's some other things. Um, but now we're going to uh, take a trip way back. Um, this piece was written in uh, the early part of the 17th century by Michael Pretorius. Michael Pretorius was born uh, in 1571 in Germany. Also born in 1571 in Germany was Johannes Kepler, who is widely regarded as uh, the father of modern astronomy. He described accurately the uh, planetary motion. So he is um, surely one of these giants upon whose shoulders so many would have had to stand such that in 1961, April 12th, Yuri Gagarin to, could break the bonds of Earth and journey into space. So I hope you enjoy this, our tribute to the way back early space explorer, Johannes Kepler. This is the Morning Star. You know, this is sort of a performance that we have timed out, but I'll tell you what, I'll be around afterwards, okay. and I'm happy to answer any questions, because I love your costume. I, I, when, I, 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 I understand it's a uniform, yes. So I, I, I will tell you, I will give you one personal note, that I was the assistant director of science at the Goddard Space Flight Center. And it turns out that if you show up for your official NASA portrait in your Star Trek uniform, when you're that high ranking, they can't say boo to you. So in, in, in fact, my, my official portrait, yes. <laughs> 
anyway, going on to the theme of human spaceflight. Um, we are humans. Everything we need to do, we also do in space. And one of the funny things you might know about is, is not know about is sleeping in space. The uh, astronauts that are in low Earth orbit orbit every 90 minutes. And that means that every 45 minutes you go from a night to day cycle. But they actually have the astronauts on sort of an Earth-based day and night cycle. They sleep at the same time, they get up at the same time, and they find that this actually helps for the crew psychology and the crew morale. And they are awakened every day by wake-up calls that are chosen either by the crew or by people on the ground to, uh, to inspire them. They tend to be peppy songs. You know, these are wake-up calls. Get them up in the morning. Uh, they have things like uh, the themes to Star Wars, the theme to Rocky, uh, Fly Like an Eagle they did, uh, Shiny Happy People by R.E.M., the city of New Orleans. These are just some of the few things that we've actually played to wake up the astronauts. The idea of sleeping in space, well, at first, in, in the case of someone like Yuri Gagarin, it was 108 minutes. I mean, there was no need to sleep. The, uh, the Gemini crews began to have longer and longer stints, many days in space. And in fact, the first astronaut wake-up call was Gemini 6, and it was actually Hello, Dolly. So after that, it was really Skylab, where people experimented with living and working in space for extended periods of time. And you're going to see some images from the Skylab crew in their brown jumpsuits in the first sort of sleeping alcoves that we had in space. In the shuttle, we had sleeping bags that people kind of Velcroed wherever worked, and they would sleep in those, and you'll see some of those. On the space station, the crew actually has little individual alcoves that they can go in and have a little bit of privacy when they sleep. So people have different requests. A lot of times they are things related to the crew, like the fight song from a university they went to, or one of the hymns from the branches of service that they actually serve with. This next piece that we're going to hear, The Lonely Bull, was actually requested three times. It was played in Gemini and on Skylab, and was actually even requested by Neil Armstrong. So think a little bit about the human nature of, of living in space. And one thing that kind of inspires me is that we have had continuous human presence on the International Space Station for the last 16 years. If there are any people in the audience under 16, they've never been alive where there haven't been people up above them in orbit.
you may have noticed one planet we didn't talk about when we talked about Voyager was Saturn. And of course, the Voyagers did visit Saturn, but we have a whole special section on Saturn, so I was saving it for that. Saturn actually doesn't clock in at all that much smaller than Jupiter. Uh, 770 Earths could fit inside Saturn. But of course, the most amazing things about Saturn are its systems of rings. And the rings are made of trillions of particles of ice and dust and rock. Most of them are only about the size of dust grains, although some of them are as big as a house, so there are some big ones too. And these rings are incredible. They're a quarter million miles from end to end, so that would stretch from the Earth to the moon. However, on average, they're about, get this, about 100 feet thick. So whenever they say that the, you know, the rings of Saturn are as thin as a sheet of paper, there's no sheet of paper on Earth that's that thin. They're very, very thin. Uh, the only time you really get any height to the rings at all is when a small moon orbits around and its gravity kicks up some of the particles. One of the images you're going to see is the edge of a ring where a moon has passed by and, and gravitationally splashed up the edge of the ring into kilometer high pinnacles of these ring particles. Now, not only is Saturn beautiful and mysterious, uh, you'll see an image of the incredible uh, storm, which is shaped like a hexagon on the north pole of Saturn. The moons are similarly really intriguing and have some of the best chances for life, actually, outside the Earth. One movement of the piece that we're about to play about Saturn is called Titan. And Titan is the giant moon of Saturn. Again, this moon is about the size of the planet Mars. And it's the only place, besides the Earth, where there's a very thick atmosphere. And in fact, it is raining right now on the moon of Saturn, Titan. There are rivers flowing and there are lakes. But seeing as the surface temperature is about 350 degrees below zero Fahrenheit, it's not water. It's actually rain and lakes and rivers of liquid methane. Underneath the methane, we actually think there's a tremendous amount of liquid water. And we see cryovolcanoes, volcanoes of water and ice, mixing this together. That makes Titan, with its thick atmosphere, organics, and water, an excellent place for life to have begun. And it is one of the places where we may have indirect evidence of life that we need to follow up on. I would love to go back to Titan. We landed on Titan. As part of the Cassini program, which launched in 2005, we sent the Huygens lander down, and we have landed on the surface of this moon. And you'll see an image coming down as we parachuted through the atmosphere of Titan. It's worth mentioning that the images you're seeing are real. I often need to kind of stop people and say, this is not a special effect. This is not a beautiful painting. These are real images that we're taking right now. Other moons that are really amazing, uh, the moon Enceladus has an icy shell and geysers of liquid water that shoot from an underground ocean. And the Cassini spacecraft has been flying through these geysers. We actually call it the car wash whenever it does it. I mean, of course, the water turns into ice as it explodes up into space. But we've detected things like organics and salts and uh, the possibility of an environment that would be friendly to life. You'll also see smaller moons like Mimas and Iapetus, which are, are mysteries and beauties all, all of their own. Now, the Cassini spacecraft has been orbiting Saturn since 2005. In 2017, we will deliberately crash it into Saturn. The spacecraft is aging, and we want to make sure that we have enough guidance to do that. So stay tuned for some spectacular images as we go all the way into the planet Saturn, September 2017. Thank you.
As beautiful as all those moons of Saturn are, you may not realize how special our moon is here around the Earth. It's an unusually large and close moon. In most places in the solar system, you wouldn't be able to see really the surface of any of these moons. 
And so the moon for us has always been this place. You know, people have been making myths about who could live on the moon, what, what deities might live there, could you travel to the moon? So of course, one of the most amazing accomplishments humankind ever had was that we sent people to walk on the moon. And this is the one thing that I, I can almost not even imagine what it'd be like to be dirty with the soil of another world to actually look up and see the entire Earth in front of you and have it be just a small, bright thing hanging in the sky. Twelve human beings have had this experience. Twelve people have walked on the moon. Now, this is something that also is a bit frustrating for me because it's in our past. It was uh, July 20th, 1969, that we first landed on the moon, and I wasn't born yet. And when we left the moon, December 14th of 1972 was the date the last person left the surface of the moon. I was just about three years old. Of course, people in the audience were showing up on the satellite around the moon called the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. And it is looking for, hopefully, the future areas that we will send humans to explore. It's making an, a map of the moon where the pixel size is actually about 10 centimeters. We see every little bump and wiggle and rock. But it's interesting when I was brushing up on my facts on the moon, you know, Googling the dates of the moon and who all went there. And in fact, you're gonna see pictures of all of the different Apollo crews, uh, not only the people who landed on the moon, but also the people who orbited it. And we, we begin with the tragic Apollo 1 crew that were lost uh, during a training exercise. But as I'm looking all of this up, I'm constantly bombarded by conspiracy theories. We, we, we never went to the moon. And I, I have no idea how this has been allowed to actually grab its way and, and, and finger its way into our cultural consciousness. I mean, to me, that's a huge shame because this is something that we as the United States have to be the most proud of. And it's the same with Yuri. This is not accomplishment just of the United States. It's an accomplishment of humanity. And I think Neil Armstrong said that very well as he stepped onto the moon for the first time. So you're going to see images from our lunar reconnaissance orbiter right now, you know, looking at the moon, and you'll see, looking down on the Apollo landing sites, you can still see where the landers are and the lunar modules and the flags and even little trails made by the footprints of the astronauts. So now we're from above, gazing down. And I hope very soon, I hope in my lifetime, we'll see people return to the moon. So to that end, that leaves us still howling at the moon.
For our last piece, I want to take us back to Yuri Gagarin in space for the first time, the first human that was ever able to see our planet from above in that way. Now Yuri was known for having nerves of steel, and he was somebody that could be in imminent danger and was very, very calm, you know, typical astronaut, cosmonaut type. But the morning of his launch on Bostek 1, he was, he was really quite not himself. Uh, the medical people actually recorded that he was pale, that he was quiet and that he was sort of withdrawn and, and humming little bits of tunes to himself. So he was put on a giant explosive and launched into space. He experienced nearly 10 times the force of gravity. He actually did remain conscious through it. And after his one orbit, he fell back through the atmosphere in flame and the Vostok capsule began to violently gyrate. And at this time, we actually have a recording of what Yuri was doing and he was humming he was humming something from Dmitry, Sh Dmitry Shostakovich called The Motherland Hears. Now this one very alone person actually off the planet is falling through fire and probably expects that he's going to die. And this is the piece of music in his head as he did it. That's what we're going to play next. Now, I say this not to take Yuri Gagarin off a pedestal. Yuri Gagarin is certainly a hero of mine. But I think it's important to remember how much we're all up on that pedestal together. It was people who did these things. It was people who figured out how to get us into space, people who explored using the Voyager and other robotic probes, people that will bring us back to space and hopefully onto Mars someday. So it is a very human endeavor that we're involved in. And there are a lot of images you're going to see now looking back to Earth. What did Yuri see? Yuri had a very small window. Now the, the astronauts have a much better, even sort of a cupola that they go out and look down at Earth. You'll see things like deserts and storms. Uh, you'll see uh, actually Florida and Cuba. At the time, there was a lot of strife in, the, in that area. Of course, from, from, the, from orbit, there are no borders. There, there's no suggestion of the politics of Earth. You'll also see pictures of the Earth at night, and these are real images. You'll see the aurora borealis from the space station, but also the lights of Earth below, including Moscow, which is a very large city and had a lot of central planning, and you can actually see the rings of lights of different highways and neighborhoods around Moscow. So as we play this piece of music, and as we celebrate Yuri's night, let's all take that journey with him. He had the courage to launch himself off the surface of this planet, the first time in history, and we have followed and we have done him honor. And I have been so honored to be here with the US Army Band. So to end, we have the motherland here's. <laughs> 